My primary task is to expound what the New Testament says about the meaning of the death of Jesus. Speaking as a first century historian, I'm trying to understand what Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, etc., etc., thought they were talking about. Interesting, Paul doesn't say God condemned Jesus. He says God condemned sin in the flesh of Jesus. Jesus was only dead for three days and God knew he'd get him back in heaven. He, he's even called it a bad weekend in human camp. Um. <laughs> This reminds me of, of, of watching a child go into a maze, taking a wrong turning, and then in order to get out, taking another wrong turning and another wrong turning. The Ask N.T. Write Anything podcast. Let's go to a question, first of all, from Galen in Cambridgeshire, who asks, My question is about your views on penal substitution and salvation. When you've raised criticism on this topic, are you, A, simply trying to bring balance to the discussion about our calling here on earth, and where we go when we die. Or B, saying that the traditional understanding of penal substitution is not correct and God did not actually require Jesus to die as a sacrifice for sins. So let's start there and uh, there's a follow-up question. Sure. Um, I, I think there is a sense in which I'm trying to do both of the things that Caleb mentions, but I would want to say my primary task is to expound what the New Testament says about the meaning of the death of Jesus. And as I do that, speaking as a first century historian, I'm trying to understand what Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, etc., etc., thought they were talking about. And as I do that, I find that different ways of talking about Jesus' death in the last 2,000 years have sometimes got hold of some bits of what's in the New Testament, but then missed out other bits, and then produce distortions by emphasizing some things in one way and, and not rather than another. So I'm not simply starting out there in the tradition and trying to correct things. I'm trying to take a run at it from the New Testament again, which actually has been my life's work to say, mm -hmm. let's just read the Bible and see where we go with that. <laughs> but um, clearly there have been distortions within what has been called penal substitution. And for me, quite a breakthrough in thinking about this some years ago was realizing that the phrase penal substitution can mean quite different things to different people according to which story you put it in. If you have an element of a story and you frame it within one narrative, it means something quite different. You know, supposing you see somebody walking down the street and carrying a briefcase, um, it's a very different sort of thing if actually this is the briefcase that that Russian spy was carrying two minutes ago mm. and they just passed in the street from if it's um, um, a man who left his briefcase at home and his wife has kindly brought it to him. So th the same thing can mean something different in a different narrative. So penal substitution can be expressed in very damaging ways. And even when preachers don't intend to do this, it is quite clearly the case that this is how many, many people, particularly young people, hear it. Mm. The idea being that there is this big, bullying, angry God who's very cross with us all, and he's got a big stick, and he's about to lash out. And fortunately, somebody gets in the way, happens to be his own son, so that somehow makes it all right. Mm. And phew, we, we get off. Now, Last year or the year before, I forget, I had a, a, a public discussion on this um, with some, some colleagues in America, and uh, one angry theologian got up from the floor and said, nobody believes that, nobody teaches that these days. <laughs> and one of the colleagues on the panel stood up, answered it for me. He said, I teach first-year undergrads at a certain college, which I won't name. He said, what Tom has said is precisely what they all think mm. the gospel is, and they're struggling to know whether to believe it or right. not. So now, if that is what people have heard and are hearing, then we've got some serious work to do because we have taken John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and what people have heard is God so hated the world that he killed his only son. And then... When you say that in a world where there is child abuse and domestic violence and so on, people think, I know that bully of a god and I hate him. And then the whole thing goes horribly, horribly okay. wrong. Okay, if you were to, as it were, look at it in its most sympathetic light, that particular way of understanding the term, what, what would you say is a, a, a better way of understanding Well, it? from that point of view, obviously the thing to emphasize is that what happens on the cross is the sovereign act of love on behalf of the Father himself. That the, the, the death of Jesus reveals the love of God. Paul says in Romans 5, God commends his love to us in that while we were still sinners, the Messiah died for us. And for that, of course, you need a very tight nexus between God and Jesus because it makes no sense to say, I love you so much, I'm sending somebody else to do the dirty work. I love you so much, I'm coming to do it myself. 
So that there is a, a strong Trinitarian theology built into the New Testament at that very point. I've always felt um, that that's sometimes where the missing link is, is simply the fact that it's God himself on the cross. Yes, in yes, that sense. yes, which then, of course, causes other problems when Jesus says, my God, why mm. did you abandon me, etc. And that's that's a real problem which can only be dealt with by a very careful uh, investigation of, if you like, what it meant to be Jesus, what it meant to be the one in whom the living presence of Israel's God came to dwell in our midst. And that's that's the heart of all the mystery of the gospel, and it's a source of endless wonder. But uh, so what I've tried to do is then to say, well, hang on, in the New Testament, the results of the death of Jesus isn't simply, well, I was very sinful, now fortunately somebody's taken my punishment, so I get to go to heaven. That is actually to moralize our vision of what it means to be human. Mor now, let, don't misunderstand me. Morals matter. Sin is important. Mm. I'm not saying it doesn't. But sin is a failure rather than uh, simply the breaking of rules. It's, it's, it's the failure to be genuinely human. The Greek word hamartia, sin, means missing the mark, shooting an arrow at a target and missing. Mm. What is the target? The target is genuine humanness. What is genuine humanness? It's reflecting God's image. And, and whenever we are tempted to sin, what is actually going on is that there is something we are supposed to be doing and being to honor God in the world, in our family, in our own lives, whatever. And sin draws us away from that, presents us with a cheap alternative or whatever, so that then we collude with forces of destruction and chaos and darkness. And then we, we basically say to the principalities and powers, which, by the way, I don't have good language for the powers of darkness, mm. and they didn't have good language in the first century for the powers of darkness, but you have to acknowledge, and if after the 20th century we can't acknowledge this, how stupid are we, that there, there is a superhuman power of darkness which still is active. But then how does that work? Through us giving our human authority to idols, to things that we worship. The result of that is sin, which means we are bound in a tight grip, Jesus dying for our sin releases the grip of the powers. That's the, well, that's the central thing. Now, a, a number of different people have emailed in essentially the same question, but what do we mean when we say a phrase that has come so easily <laughs> to, to the tongue, Jesus died for our sins or on yes. our behalf? Yes. What, I mean, is, what are we actually saying in saying a, a phrase like that? When Paul says that, he adds the phrase, according to the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean I can find three proof texts, mm -hmm. e.g. Isaiah 53. What it means is there is an entire scriptural narrative which is about how the creator God is rescuing the world, and that scriptural narrative is shaped by the Exodus particularly, and then by all the things that follow from the Exodus, but then coming through the whole story of Israel in exile, where the people who are supposed to be bearing the solution for the world are themselves suffering the result of the problem. And the Messiah, Israel's Messiah, comes to the point where that story has reached rock bottom, in order to take its weight upon himself and so to begin new creation. So it's creation, covenant, exile, And, and when you speak of Jesus taking the weight of that upon himself, again, we're, we're speaking in pictures and, and mm -hmm, metaphors mm -hmm. and so on, but but what I suppose the question a lot of people have is, what, what does that literally mean in the sense? Well, what, what, what happens on the cross um, to, I want to know release what, the weight to, to, that Jesus died for our sins? I, I want to so know on. what literally means literally as well in that, <laughs> in that sentence, which is often a problem. But the, the clearest passage, I think, in Paul yeah. about this is Romans 8, 3 and 4, when uh, having said there is no condemnation for those who are in Messiah Jesus because the law of the spirit of life in Messiah Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death, because God has done what the law couldn't do since it was weak through the flesh, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as a sin offering, here's the thing, he condemned sin in the flesh. There is no condemnation for us because God passed sentence of condemnation on sin. Interesting, Paul doesn't say God com condemned Jesus. He says God condemned sin in the flesh of Jesus. Here's one way of looking at it, mm. which is a reading of Romans 7 and 8, that God gave the law extraordinarily, and Romans 7 is a very difficult passage, in order to draw sin onto one place, in order to lure sin to the place where it could be condemned, namely 
to Israel's representative, who is therefore the world's representative. So Jesus dies as the representative substitute, taking the condemnation on himself, so that having condemned sin, sin is now itself condemned, and new creation can begin. And that's the energy of the Spirit taking it forward. You talked about the way that this is all building up from Old Testament to New yeah, yeah. Um, in this. And a couple of the questions that came in are, are in regard to how the Old Testament sacrificial system mm-hmm, relates mm-hmm. To, to Jesus' sacrifice. So Grant in Oxford asks, um, I understand how the sin offering in the Old Testament relates in the New Testament to Jesus' atoning sacrifice, but what about other Old Testament offerings, such as the wave offering, peace offering, fellowship offerings? How yes, do they yes, relate yes. to New Testament theology? Yes, What's their yes. symbolic meaning for Christians? Th- th- this is a huge question, and again, we've got multiple misunderstandings, and I grew up with the belief which is which is a very standard one in many systems of preaching that what's going on when in the Old Testament somebody offers a sacrifice is they come and they confess their sins over the head of the animal, the animal then gets killed so the animal is bearing the punishment for their sins. That's simply straightforwardly wrong. That is not what happens. The animal over whose head sin is confessed is the scapegoat, which is the one animal that doesn't get killed. It gets driven off Mm. into the wilderness because having got the sins of Israel symbolically confessed on it, it's now unclean. You couldn't offer it Mm. to God as a sacrifice. And we we have to stand way back and rethink the whole thing because the language of sacrifice is woven into the way that the Western tradition has thought about atonement, um, about um, Jesus dying as a punishment for sins or whatever. But it's simply not what sacrifices were about. When you read the Pentateuch, which is a hard book to read, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, but if you imagine reading it at a run, Mm. it goes like this. Creation, sin, uh, fall, idolatry, etc. Call of Abraham. Abraham's family turn out to be themselves deeply dysfunctional. There is a moment of reconciliation at the end of Genesis, but then there they are. They're enslaved in Egypt, and God rescues them so that the people who are carrying the solution to the world's problems will know themselves to be the rescued slaves. That's really important. But they are rescued in order that the tabernacle, the living presence of God, can come and dwell in their midst. Now, that is the danger moment. To stand at the intersection of heaven and earth is a very dangerous place to be because no no one can see God and live Mm -hmm. and all that. So there's a whole book of health and safety rules as to how you handle this. It's called Leviticus. Yes. And the sacrificial system in Leviticus is not about punishing animals so that we get off Mm. and go to heaven. It's about if God is going to live in the midst, then the sanctuary needs to be purified, the people need to be purified on a regular basis. It's like we say in the Lord's Mm. Prayer every day, forgive us our trespasses, because we are praying that God's kingdom will come on earth as in heaven. It's the same thing. The point of the biblical story is not how do we get into God's presence, it's how does God get into our presence? And, and how then do we purify that? So then the sacrifices, the, the blood offerings are, and notice in Leviticus and Numbers, the animals aren't killed on an altar. That happens in pagan sacrifices. Right. The animals are killed somewhere else. That's irrelevant. Mm. The point is the blood, which is the life, is presented on the altar because the lifeblood functions as a kind of detergent to cleanse the pollution. Now, as Hebrews says, That is actually only a sign and a symbol, um, but ultimately the life of Jesus himself purifies us and the whole sanctuary. And then in the letter to the Hebrews, there's lots of complicated stuff about the heavenly sanctuary and the earthly sanctuary. But the point is God wants to dwell in the midst and the sacrificial system, including wave offerings, heave offerings, mm. uh, cereal offerings. You, know, the cere- you don't kill the cereal no, offerings, no. Um, so th- which should have blown the whistle on that right. idea initially. That, that's is, so is, is, helpful. Is helpful? Because, yeah. No, it, it yeah. really is, because I think you've really helped to distinguish between what's being meant in, mm-hmm. in different terms mm-hmm. of sacrifices. But, but I, have to, I have to say, I have many times over my career asked Jewish scholars, what did first century Jews think they were doing when they brought yes. offerings to the temple? And I've started in the last 10 or 15 years to get really good answers. Right. My colleague David Moffat in St. Andrews is an expert on this. I've learned a lot from him. He's a, is a Hebrew mm. scholar particularly. Yeah. Um, well, I hope that's also helped to answer the question that came in from Steve in Ogden, Utah, who asked how the Old Testament temple sacrifice relate to thinking about the atonement. But um, let's turn to uh, another question, um, which is from Mike in New Jersey. 
Um, and he, he says there's a popular atheist podcaster in the United States, David Smalley, and he continually asks the following question to his Christian guests. How is God sending his son to earth, for instance, John 3.16, a sacrifice? Uh, he defines, uh, David Smalley defines a sacrifice as giving up something that the person will not get back. And he claims, well, Jesus was only dead for three days and God knew he'd get him back in heaven. He, he's even called it a bad weekend in human camp. Um, <laughs> How would you respond to that kind of objection? <laughs> this reminds me of, of, of watching a child go into a maze, taking a wrong turning, and then in order to get out, taking another wrong turning and another wrong turning. Right. I mean, that sentence is, is a brilliant example of sort of one mistake on top of another on top of another. And I want to say, if that's the kind of thing that that podcaster has heard Christians say, then it just shows that Christians too can get themselves into a right old muddle. Because actually, God sending Jesus is a sacrifice in the sense that I was talking about, in that God wants to dwell with his people. And uh, John's gospel, that's what it's all about. The word became flesh and tabernacled in our midst. And Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world so that God can dwell mm. in our midst, mm. in Jesus, and then in the person of the Spirit. Um, and that suddenly looks totally different. And he's just defined sacrifice as somebody giving up something they won't get back. That's a kind of a modern meaning of sacrifice. Okay. And part of the difficulty is that a word like sacrifice and a word like atonement, these have got modern English connotations which don't correspond to anything in Scripture. And we as Christians get fooled by this and make our own constructs. And we have to go back again and mm. again. Sorry to be boring about this. We yeah. have to go back to the original meaning of Scripture. Um, you've, you've summed it up quite nicely. I mean, sometimes I, uh, sometimes it, I hear people responding to these kinds of objections to say, um, you know, well, it wasn't that much of a sacrifice, Jesus oh, yeah, dying yeah, and yeah. only coming back three days later. And, and some Christians might say, but what he experienced on the cross, um, alienation from the Father and, and so on, that was, in a sense, yeah. is, a, is, is a, a fate, if you like, that, that yes. we can h hardly imagine the, I mean, the consequences I, it, it, it of. It seems to me, when you read the Gospels, something, there's something very interesting going on because... As we know, with any real big event, there are several different ways you can mm. look at it, which may well all be true simultaneously. Think of Julian Barnes's novel, Flaubert's Parrot, where his pictures of Flaubert appear to be totally incompatible, and yet it was all the same man. He was mm. just a very rich, mm. complex, and, and rather, rather strange character. <laughs> but So when you get John and when you get Luke, you might think, on a first reading, it would be wrong, but you might think that Jesus... It, that it's not really a problem for Jesus to die on the cross. You know, this will be unpleasant, mm. but it's soon over mm. sort of thing. When you get Matthew and Mark, it's very different. This is Jesus um, in Gethsemane, uh, really agonizing over it. Mm. You, you do get that a bit in Luke as well, mm. but but I think in, in Matthew and Mark it's strongest because then in Matthew and Mark it ends up with Jesus on the cross quoting Psalm 22, yeah. my God, why did you mm. abandon me? And so then we have, as I think we've mentioned before, the God-forsakenness of God. And yes. some of the great theologians of our age, people like Jürgen Moltmann, have tried to say it in that paradoxical way in order to say that somewhere at the heart of the one God, there is the agony of the world being born and shared and that that mustn't be downplayed as though that was a trivial thing. Mm. And that's very difficult for us to say. Although people who have shared in the agonies of the world and people who in prayer have had a sense of what some have called the darkness of God um, will say, even if in retrospect, it seems to last only a short time, it's still pretty appalling while it's happening. One last question. Um, Paul in Winnipeg, Canada asks, what do you believe scripture is teaching about Christ's descent to the dead mentioned in the Apostles' Creed and in the early church fathers' dialogue? A descent into Sheol or Hades? Or is it, as some translations of the Creed put it, a descent into hell? And perhaps you could comment on the yeah. scriptural passage yeah, that that's yeah, based yeah. on as well. <clears throat> yes, the idea of Jesus descending into Sheol or into the, the abode of the dead um, is based on First Peter. Um, and this is after the crucifixion that yes, this yes, is generally yes, seen. Yes, that, that after Jesus has died, then kind of where is he for the next 36 hours mm -hmm. sort of thing. 
And in Luke, it says that he says to the brigand, today you will be with me in paradise. So how does that work? Mm. Part of our problem here is that we don't have, again, good English words to name what they meant much more vaguely by Sheol or Hades or whatever. It, this is an arm-waving sort of language about gone to the place of the dead. And if, if we say descent into hell, then you could say, and some Christian traditions have said this, that this is the, the so-called harrowing of hell, that he goes down to hell um, in order to say, okay, guys, it's all over, coming up out of here. If you look at Greek Orthodox icons of the resurrection, it's Jesus leading Adam and Eve out of the underworld. Um, now, there's all sorts of things going on there, which I don't think the New Testament uh, is talking about, mm. because in First Peter, it talks about Jesus going to preach to the spirits in prison. And then there's, there's a couple of passages there. There's one in First Peter 3, when he goes and preaches, First Peter 3, 19, preaches to the people who formerly didn't obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. Looks as though this is referring to those very strange creatures in the early chapters of the book of Genesis who were particularly wicked and as though Jesus has gone down to tell them, right, your doom is nigh. In other mm. words, this isn't preaching in the sense of persuading them to believe or anything like that. This is telling them the final battle has been won and you lost. And then uh, however, um, in in First Peter four six, um, it says this is why the gospel was preached to the dead, so that though judged like humans in the flesh, they might live in the spirit according to God. Now that's a very odd passage. I mm. don't claim to know exactly what Peter meant or how we should then interpret it, but I think. There's been quite a, a, a good amount of work done, theologians like von Balthasar in the last century, exploring the mystery of Holy Saturday, the mystery of the day between Good Friday and Easter. What do we say about God, about Jesus? And, and many have said something about that whole drama is that Jesus takes the loving presence of God down to the very deepest that human um, uh, human horror and anguish can go. And that's an image I think I can relate to, even though I wouldn't stress it, because that doesn't seem to me where the New Testament itself lays the weight. 